Harman Kardon PM665. This is the big brother to the PM655 that I did and uh, mismarked it originally on the video when I put the title. I accidentally put it as a 665, but it was a 655. And one of the main differences other than wattage, this one's 100 watts per channel. I think the 655 was something like either 60 watts or 65 watts, 80 watts, something like that. But that one had a single power transformer. This one is a dual power supply, so it has two power transformers in it. And it's, of course, higher wattage. It's still from that same era, pretty much. Now, I've had, I've had several Harman Kardons of this era on my bench. And a couple things that seem to be uh, consistent through this era is, first of all, the build quality of these. The components, the circuit design, everything is really good. This has a fantastic phono stage. You can switch between moving magnet and moving coil. It has the capacitive trimming for the uh, cartridge. So this has a really good phono stage. What I don't like about these is I've noticed that the circuit boards are very brittle. They crack very easily and the circuit traces will crack and get hairline cracks that are very hard to troubleshoot. And I've had several that have done that. These little switches here, by the time they get this age, they're extremely delicate and they fail pretty easily. These ones look to be all good, which is good. Another thing that happens is these are nice aluminum knobs, but the little plastic inserts, as you can see, <laughs> come unglued. I think what happens is the plastic shrinks with age, and then people try to super glue them, and super glue just does not work between this anodized aluminum and the plastic. You really have to use something like JB Weld or JB Quick and put a thin coating of it on there and glue these back together. So all of these are loose. Unfortunately, it looks like somebody got a little bit happy with the crazy glue and now the plastic is glued to the shaft on a couple of these. So that might be a big problem if we have to take this apart. But uh, other than that, you know, the like I said, some the build quality is just not to, up to par with some of the older models of gear that they made. But it's an excellent amplifier. They perform very well and they're, they're worth having. I mean, honestly, it, as far as performance goes. So we're going to go through this one. I have no idea if it works or uh, to what degree it works, but we're going to clean it up. We're going to do all the tests on it, try to restore it as best we can and go through, make sure it's aligned properly and then give it a good test and see how it performs. So if that sounds interesting to you, stay tuned and that's what we're going to do. All right, one of the things I've noticed is these speaker terminals are all bent and that may have happened in shipping. Um, this was pretty, pretty well packed when it was shipped, honestly. But these things, if they're not screwed in, and these were all threaded out, you see that? Whenever you ship these, make sure these are screwed down and make sure you properly put foam around here so that nothing can press against it. Um, or these are very flimsy. They'll, they'll bend very easily, these banana plugs. So you gotta kinda watch these binding posts here. So we'll have to see if we can straighten those out and make them a little better. Uh, the fuses, again, I always like to check, you know, this is how we find some clues. This is supposed to be a 5 amp when you're running it at 110 volts or a 2.5 amp if you're running it at 240. And this is a 5 amp fuse, which is good. And we'll check this other one one fuse for each power supply. This kind of gives you some clues, you know, if there's a, if somebody puts some aluminum foil around a fuse in here, 
And you could see this one's di a different type of fuse, so it has been replaced at one point in time. Uh, let's see. 250 volt. 2.5 amps, you see. So we have two different fuses here. Well, it's rather dusty in there, but wow, look at these massive transformers. Now remember, this is 100 watts per channel, so each one of these, this great big transformer is just for a single mono 100 watt amplifier. So this amp will have all kinds of headroom. And you can see nice big capacitors. Those are, what, 10,000 RPM, or 10,000 micro, 10,000 RPMs, 10,000 microfarads each. And we can see there's your rectifiers, two of them with nice heat sinks on them. Nice big heat sinks for the power transistors. And that's another thing is on the PM655, the transistors are those uh, MT200 type, the, the long narrow ones with the pins coming out the sides. And they're mounted up underneath, I believe. And the heat sink sticks up like this, but the transistors are underneath. You have to flip the unit over. And you can see these ones are mounted traditionally, like on the side of the heat sinks. You can see over here inside the shield, this is your phono stage. It's all shielded and covered in here, which is excellent. And you can see what I'm talking about. I'll zoom in a little bit for you. You have to be very careful working on these amplifiers. When you look, see how thin that circuit board is? And just the type of material they make it out, out of, it will break very, very easily. And you can see in here, let me get a little pointer, you see all these little right here, these little connectors. Those are connectors that connect the front board to this bottom board here. And they can, and you can see how tiny some of those tracks can get. And they will, you'll get these little micro cracks inside there from these flexing. It's very delicate. And when they do that, you get these intermittent problems where the amp will cut out. And it can be a real bugger to get in there and try to find where the little crack is. So what I like to do is I like to go through all of these and just reflow all the solder joints and make sure they're all on there really good <laughs> before we turn this back over to someone. The good news is we don't have a lot of that glue that you see in things from this vintage. And none of the trans or none of the capacitors look like they're bulged or anything like that or leaking. But we will, of course, we'll recap this. Uh, but I think we have something to work with. The nice thing is this doesn't look like there was any service done on it. We have a nice Alps potentiometer. With, <laughs> and the knob came off of it as well. So, yeah. I think this will be a good project. Now before we get started, just a quick word, and this is an actual PM665. There's also another model called the 665VXI. It's a newer model. Uh, instead of 100 watts per channel, it is 150 watts per channel. Uh, different, different circuit inside somewhat, but generally very sim shares a lot of similarity but it's a newer version. I just gave this thing a preliminary once over before I plugged it in. And it, in fact, does have a lot of the characteristic issues that these things suffer. So for instance, if we look over here, i put some light on the subject. And when we lock down the camera, and if we zoom in, you can see down here a lot of these little circuit traces kind of have rings around them. You can see, and they're somewhat loose. Some of them are good, but uh, I found a few of them. If we go over to the phono stage, let me rotate that around. 
Let's see if I can get some light on the subject for you there. And if you look down here, these ones are really bad. You can see that these are just moving around loose. See, that one's just totally loose. See how it's broken? That one's broken real bad. That one's broken. This one's bad, it's broken. That one's completely desoldered. So you can see all the components, how they come loose. This is something that you'll see a lot of. And whenever you go and work on one of these Harman Kardons from this era, the 655 is the same way, and I suspect a lot of the other ones as well from this era are all like that. So a little word of warning, anytime you're going to restore one of these, make sure you go through all the circuit boards. I know it sounds tedious, and it is to a little bit, but these are great amplifiers, and they're worth the effort. Go through, check all the boards, make sure there are no little cracks in the tracks. That's the worst problem you'll have on these. They're very hard to troubleshoot if you have that. But go through and touch up all the little solder joints, and just take your time. I mean, this is a hobby for most of us, you know. Take your time, do it right, and this will be a great amplifier. So we're going to do that. We're, before we do any of that, though, even with all that, we're going to power this up and just check some things. And we're going to play around with the schematics on this video, or at least on this series, we'll say, if we do more than one video here. And most interesting is the protection circuit and we're going to discuss how it works some of the advantages and disadvantages and we're going to see how some of the principles they used in this protection circuit have been used in the past uh, if you recall the Mac macintosh mc2100 series that i did some of the things they used for that some of the carver gear that that you see uh, there's a some of the principles they use for the protect circuit in that is similar. So very unique, very neat, and uh, we'll look at some of those things. Well, let's power this up and see if we have any DC on the speaker terminals. I have this meter connected to left channel and this one connected to right channel to look at DC millivolts. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to plug this in and turn it on and we're going to look at the dim bulb. I have this bulb on, which is a 110 watt bulb, and we'll just see if it lights up as the caps charge and then drops down. All right, power coming on. That's a good sign. And the protect relay didn't click in. Ha, fooled you all. <laughs> there is no protect relay on these. The protect circuit does not have a relay on the outputs. We'll get more into that later. All right, let's look at our DC. Well, that's not very good. 300 millivolts on the left channel and 747 millivolts on the right channel. I would say that is some pretty horrific DC offset. And looks like it's climbing as we go. Now I have all the controls set, you know, at center range. I have the volume all the way down. And we are just getting really, really bad DC offset. That's why you don't just put these on your bench and connect them to a set of speakers and start playing it. <laughs> now this is one of the things that's a problem with this design. Let's talk about why. Okay, schematic time. Some of you love this, some of you hate this, <laughs> but we're doing it. The first thing you notice here is your protect circuit, <clears throat> and we'll get more into what this does here in a minute. But looking up here, here's your main power amplifier. And when they drew this schematic, they actually showed the signal path <clears throat> in this dark, this dark thick line. This kind of shows you your signal path coming from the inputs, going all the way out to the speaker for the left channel. 
the right channel is just the same, but they're just making it easier for you. If you look here, here's your pair of outputs. So you have two NPNs and two PNPs. It's a complementary class AB amplifier. And right at this midpoint, this is where, the, where your speaker output is. This should be zero volts in a perfect world. It never is, but it should be very low, just a few millivolts if properly adjusted. And normally what most protect circuits will do is one of their functions will be to monitor this output here at, this, at the midpoint of these transistors. And if your voltage, if you, your DC offset gets more than maybe about a voltage drop of a diode, like 500 millivolts, 300 millivolts, somewhere around there, uh, or a little higher, it will actually drop out a relay, set of relay contacts that are in series with your speakers and it'll prevent DC from getting onto the speakers. With this particular amplifier, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, now, the way this works is if it sees too much DC, which we're not quite there yet in this instance, what it will do is it's supposed to, you see these little FETs here. These little, I think these are JFETs. I'd have to look them up. But what they do is they can actually clamp down the signal going into the amplifier to prevent it from driving into clipping. So this, this amp should do very well with not allowing clipping to take place and not allowing DC to get on the terminals when you overdrive the amplifier. The problem with this is, is if something shorts, like let's say one of these transistors dead shorts, that DC voltage right here can go straight through those transistors and straight out to your speakers and blow your speakers. Now this isn't the only amplifier in the world that does that. A lot of them do. If you go way back a ways on some of my videos, I did a series on the ADCOM GFA585, which was actually a very high-end amplifier in its day. And I know some of you say it's junk. Everybody has their opinions. Anyway, <laughs> whatever. It, it's a powerful amplifier. And a lot of people really like them, including myself. But they're the same way. There is no, there is no protect circuit for hard DC on the outputs. And if the output transistor's short in that amplifier, you will, if you don't blow the speaker, uh, blow the fuse, the line fuse for the power supply, you're basically going to vaporize your speakers. And that's one downside of these. But in theory, the way this is supposed to work is it's never supposed to let these transistors turn on to the point where they can put a dangerous amount of voltage out to the speakers. Now, is 700 millivolts dangerous to your speakers? Eh, I wouldn't want to have upwards of one volt sitting DC on a, on a voice coil of a speaker constantly because that will put heat on that voice coil, unnecessary amounts of heat. More importantly though, with that level of, of DC offset, this thing is going to have horrific distortion, especially at very low, vo low volume levels and at high frequencies. And so definitely that's something that we're going to want to address early on. Now part of that could be because of our cold solder joint problem that a lot of these suffer from. If we have a loose connection, it could affect the voltage at one of these transistors and it could throw off that DC offset. It also could just be that it's out of adjustment. Uh, but what I usually find with this kind of design is if it's that far out on both channels, I, you can adjust the pot and a lot of times you adjust the, the control for the DC offset and bias and you can get it to come in and then it'll just move again on you. It'll move around. And that's because you're not fixing the actual problem in there. You're just trying to mask it by adjusting it out temporarily. 
But again, if you have a leaky transistor, if you have a cold solder joint, uh, something, you know, bad connection somewhere, adjusting your DC offset and bias won't fix it. So really you have to go through and find out why. I normally don't like to just go in there and willy-nilly adjust these when they're way out like that. If this was a few millivolts higher than spec, then I would say it's just a matter of adjusting the, the pots. But in this instance, it's that far out. There may be something more to it than that. We'll have to look. But anyway, that's just a little primer <laughs> of what we're going to get into on this. I want to really take my time on this one and go through everything. And when we're done, I want to have a perfect working PM665 amplifier that's going to be reliable and last a long time. Okay, we have the amplifier on. We have it connected to the dummy load. And I have a 1 kilohertz signal into the auxiliary input. The current limiting is on still. And I don't know, I have all three bulbs in, so it's very, you could see how dim they are. And that's because when we start turning the volume up, we are going to see, <laughs> we don't want too much current limit because we want to see the amp actually you know, put out a clean signal. You're still not going to be able to drive the amp hard like this because the bulbs will limit the current, but that should get us to where we need. The first thing you'll notice, if you look on the scope, there's your DC offset. So you can see where right on the line there is where the, uh, where our zero volts would be, same here. But you can see this, the left channel is, or the right channel is a lot worse than the left. And that's what we were seeing, if you remember. Now, you got to times this by 10 because I have the times 10 divider or my 10 to 1 divider set up on my dummy load for the scope output. So technically, if you want to look at, we go to 20 millivolts per division there. Sorry, and I turned the wrong knob. 20 millivolts there. Now you can really see how far off we are. That's 200 millivolts per division we're at because of the times 10. So you can see right here we're almost 100 millivolts. And here you can see 200 and right here would be about 300, 300 millivolts roughly, a little of 350, something like that. So it's pretty close. And again, now that there's a speaker load across there and it's not an open circuit, that loads that down a little bit, which is why you're not getting quite as bad as it was with open terminals. All right, let's bring this back up to about two volts per division. And of course, I messed up my time here, but, and you can see how just noisy, noisy this all is. And you can see this channel's really bad. Let's turn the balance control. Oh, look, I just touched the balance. So we have dirty controls for starters. And that may not just be a control. That might be, again, a bad, see there, solder joint on that board. I'm tapping the actual board on the, where the tone control and everything is. So yeah. And this is what I'm talking about on these, these Harman Cardons. You really got to kind of clean them up. But what I want to do is turn this way down, like crazy way down. And I want to look at the, you can see how this thing just doesn't like Let me change my trigger. Hold on a second. Okay, we set our trigger a little bit different here. And we're at 100 millivolts per division now. So this is a very small signal. And you can see even with that DC offset on the speaker terminals, you can see that there's really not any crossover distortion that we can see. 
And again, we're getting to the limits of an oscilloscope here. Oscilloscopes don't like looking at really, really low voltages. They're a high impedance input. They can, you know, you, you're seeing noise there and so forth. So you're, that is a function of the scope and the wires and everything connected to it. But anyway, I see a little bit of oscillation right there and right there and one right there and one right there. I don't know if that's just, again, if that's just noise on the cables or if that's something significant in the amplifier. We'll have to look and see. But definitely we need to check some solder joints and do some cleaning of the potentiometers before we can go any further with this. But the good news is it is working. The amplifier is passing a signal. And you can see just <laughs> your DC offset. In a perfect world, this would be up here. But we're not going to play with that yet. We're going to clean the controls and go over the solder pads and everything and kind of see what kind of improvement we can make just by doing the basics. Now, a lot of times I have a lot of people that are experienced at working with amplifiers. They even do, have done this for a living or whatever. They're way better at it than I am. And invariably, they get very frustrated with the videos and say, hey, why are you doing that? That's so, in, you know, so inefficient. That's a, you know, such a long way around to do something. This is the way you should do this. Well, understand that I do this for entertainment. Understand that if I did the same thing the same way every time on every amp, these videos would get very boring very quickly. And people who are new to this uh, hobby would not really see very many different ways of doing things. That's why each video I do, I try to do something a little bit different and use a different technique that may not be the most efficient or the best technique for this particular uh, case, but I want to demonstrate it so people can see different ways. I, the idea is to get to people to be able to think, to be able to know diff, that there are different ways of troubleshooting and checking things and doing these restorations. There is no one set way that you have to do. Um, and that's why I do that. So yes, there are probably better, more efficient ways I can do this. But we're going to go through this process and we're going to learn as we're doing it. All right, let's go through and do our basic clean up the solder joints and clean the controls and let's see what happens after that. In the process of taking the faceplate off, I kind of felt some heat and I came over here and touched these two heat sinks and the right one was quite warm. I mean, not hot, but I mean, for being on just for the few minutes that you saw it at very low milliwatts of output, these were both quite warm and shouldn't be that warm that fast. So that tells me not only is the DC offset wrong, but the bias is way off as well. These amps will idle a little bit warm because they're class AB, meaning there is a little bit of idle current on all of the transistors, even when the, when the amp's sitting at idle. But it should never get that hot that fast. When the heat sinks warm up within the first couple minutes of turning it on and they get really warm, that's probably too much bias. Uh, and the amp is running closer to class A than it is class AB. So, and I did a lot of videos on amplifier classes and things. You can go back and check those. But the other thing is you can remove the faceplate without removing the knobs. And that's important on these amps because Again, like I said, these plastic inserts that are on here, you can see they pull right off. These little plastic inserts, you can see somebody tried to glue them with super glue, and that never works with this type of plastic. And what will happen is these will really get stuck on there, and it's really hard to, sometimes to pry these off without damaging something, especially damaging the faceplate. But Harman Kardon was nice enough to make the holes larger than the actual knobs. So you can take this faceplate off and leave the knobs on and then that gives you the ability to get into this in behind here if you need to very carefully to get something to if you need to pry these off it makes it a lot easier. 
uh, just be careful you know not to hit any of these switches the other thing you're going to find out is these tiny teeny little switches here are extraordinarily delicate and fragile so be careful with them they get dirty very easily and they need clean but they're just little plastic switches and I, they fail a lot and they're really really hard to find if you need to replace one so be very careful with all of these little tiny switches Now to get this out the way I did it was I took the front face or the front plate off. You can see right here many screws later <laughs> everything comes out and then you have a lot better access. You don't have to try to shove everything back here and twist it to get it out. You can see the way these are put together. These ribbon cables are solid wire and they're very stiff so they don't bend very easily and they are barely barely soldered in there if you look how tiny the solder joints are on there it is very easy you can see for those to crack loose when you're moving this around so it's up to you if you want to work on the amp this way or if you want to work on it by disassembling if you're just trying to do a repair you can take that front plate off which just other than taking the screws out isn't very bad and you can kind of move this up like this and just work on the part that you need to work on if you're just trying to do a repair we're going to do a restoration and we're going to recap this and, and clean the controls properly and everything so I'm going to choose to take these ribbon cables off now I have the proper desoldering equipment to do it safely so I'm going to do that and then I'm going to take this top board, set it aside, and then I'm going to take this other board out and get it out on the bench where we can properly work on it. Because we really have to, this is the main part of the amp that has a lot of problems on it. I see a lot of issues with, you know, these tracks cracking and the solder joints and everything. So you want to make sure you do as much as you can <laughs> to uh, correct any little problems that might be there before you put it all back together and you have to go take it all back apart again if you did, if you missed something. So I'm going to kind of scrutinize this because again there is a difference between a restoration and just a repair. All right so let me get these ribbon cables apart and get these two boards separated and we'll get to work. All right holding the camera at an odd angle here but we have the board out I'm not going to remove these ribbon cables, it's just extra work and I can get to what, we, what I need here. And I can see, after bumping the camera, where if you look kind of in there, you can kind of see how the heat shrink wrap has like pulled away from the bottom. You can see how on the, these ones here that's not the case, I'm looking through the camera. but. And some of that could just be for manufacturing, but also if we look closely in this area, you can see that these components have gotten really warm. And again, that's probably just the way the circuit is made, or it could be that some of these capacitors or these transistors are leaky and are causing excessive current to be drawn either through these diodes or through these resistors. So we're going to have to go through and measure all of this and make sure it's good. We'll have to check these transistors and of course they're very difficult to check for leakage unless they're in circuit and working and that's a big pain because you have to put everything together to test it. So this is one of those instances where it's so much work to take one of these apart where now that you're into it you might as well replace it. This whole board can be repopulated with components, which we're not going to do, but we can at least put the caps and most of the, you know, check the resistors, replace the bad ones, and do these few transistors up here very inexpensively. So for, for what the parts are going to cost, it's worth it. Now, if I were doing this for a living, if I were doing this for a customer where I'm charging by the hour, I would probably leave these all as is, verify that there's no problems in here, clean it up, clean the controls, and as long as it's working, put it back together. But since we're doing this for fun, it's a hobby, 
take your time and let's replace the components and then we know that they're going to last another 30 years. So I'm going around this hot area where it looks like we've had extra heat and I went to check this diode and take a look. It's just falling out loose. And you can see they're all just coming apart. Now that one's mostly in there. That's pretty tight. Those are tight. But you can see what I'm talking about on these boards. I don't know what it is about these Harman Kardons, but I've seen this. Like I said, I'm not an expert on HK, but I've worked on, I don't know, four or five of them now, including this one, which isn't a whole lot. But I always seem to see this on this generation of equipment. So just some things to be aware of. If you're going to restore one of these, be prepared to take the time and go through all of it to make sure you don't get it all together and find a bunch of other problems. Looking on this side of the board, here's one of those ribbon cables. And you can see it's just falling off. It's all cracked. So, and again, a lot of the televisions that were built in this era, too, had this same issue. I think it was just this process and this type of circuit board they were using on a lot of these pieces of equipment. This was something pretty prevalent at the, in that era, that mid-1980s era. Okay, here's one of those capacitors that it was in that overheated area and you can see it's supposed to be if it'll focus 25 volts 220 microfarads and if we check it on the ES or the LCR meter yeah it's only reading 130 and that's only at 120 Hertz if we go up to kilohertz which no big deal we don't really for this particular use but if we connect this in here yeah it's down to 92 so these caps are bad now the blue ones those blue ones I showed you that are kind of in the audio path for instance here's a 47 microfarad I mean that's excellent if you compare that to a brand new Nichicon fine gold at one kilohertz, that's about the same as it would perform. All right, I have all the capacitors replaced, and now I'm looking at these transistors. I have you focused in on this one. Look at this guy right here. See it? Right there. This one here is ready to break loose. Well, this one's loose here. This one's loose here. It, this board is completely filled with bad solder joints so we're just gonna have to go through all of them now I'm gonna pull some of these transistors that were in that hot spot there and I want to make sure they're okay uh, I may even just if I have good replacements I may just replace them just so we don't have to worry about I think the reason they got hot was because they weren't making good contact with the with the traces in there but then again if they were running hot they may be damaged, so we're just going to replace them, I think. So I pulled this transistor out, and it's a KS, uh, 2SA965. So going online doing a little search, I found that the 2SA965 is, a, of course, a PNP transistor by Toshiba. And here's some of the specs. And you can see, I'll just let you take a look at that for a minute. These are kind of a tall transistor. They're, they're 900 milliwatts, so they're a little bit heavier duty. And you can take a look at the collector base, collector emitter voltages. And I just so happen to have these, let's see if I can get, a, get it to focus, these KSA 916s. I don't know if you could see that. And if I look that up, and I think I have the complement to them as well, but looking that up, you can see that 
almost identical specs. We can go down the list, but everything even down to the transition frequency is the same. So that's a direct replacement, which is good news because I had these. And their complement for the 2SA965 is the 2SC2235. And I'm sure I have the complement to these in there somewhere. But if we look, the complement to that one is a KSC, what did I say, 2316. So I wrote that down on my spec sheet here just so I remember. And I found the 916s. Like I said, I had those. Now I just need to see if I have those uh, 2316s as well. All right, I didn't have the KSC 2316s. I'll need to order some more of them. But I do have some of these KSC 2383s, which are the same transistor pretty much, except instead of 120 volt uh, collector base and collector emitter, they're 160 volts. So other than that, all the other specs are the same. So these will work. So I'm going to just use those. And I only need two of these and two of these, and that'll get rid of that hot spot. By the way, <laughs> out of all of these transistors in this bag, they were all bad. I'm really bad. I mean, way out of spec. These four were almost perfect. They were in spec. So these were the only four good capacitors on that board. One of which was the one we tested <laughs> earlier at the beginning. So, yeah, these really needed it. And I think some of them had some heat damage from all those loose traces and everything overheating. Anyway, let's get these replaced. So I've removed that Zener diode that was real loose and the solder had come loose on it and it was in that hot spot. And if we try to connect it in here to the meter, and if you look at 2 milliamps it's reading 24.69. It's a 24 volt Zener. And if I move to 5 milliamps, then to 10, then to 15, you can see how it continuously goes up in voltage. Now, if you take a brand new 24 volt Zener, and when they say 24, that's plus or minus a volt usually. They're not always exactly on, but. If we look at this one, you can see 2 milliamps, 5, 10, and 15. And you can see it stays right at that 23 volt range all the way across the board and doesn't drift. So that kind of gives me the inkling that this, this diode is bad. It's been heat damaged and I just dropped it on the floor so it's gone but we need to replace these Zener diodes thankfully we've got some of those when things get hot like that these semiconductors a lot of times they can be heat damaged like that and uh, that's the result that's what will happen and as the amplifier runs and heats up and warms up that voltage will drift and it'll throw things off which will then cause the bias to change on those transistors, which will cause them to heat up. Those heat up and then, of course, they heat the capacitors around them, cause them to dry out, and then they go bad. So we're gonna, we put all new transistors in, just in that area, and we put 105 degree Celsius capacitors instead of the 85s that were in there. So this circuit should be a lot more reliable and we soldered it very well. So let's get those replaced and <laughs> see what else we can find. By the way, it is normal to have some drift with as you increase the amount of current flowing through these Zener diodes. They will drift eventually. But at that low of a current like that, with that small of a change, they should not typically drift that much. They'll drift a little bit. Okay, the Zeners are replaced, and I just took and cleaned that up with some alcohol. But notice, it's a good idea here, when you replace these Zeners, to raise them up off the board just a little bit like that. And that will allow better airflow around them so they don't get as hot. 
and that uh, typically should help out. Now the everything else on there tested out good so we're going to leave everything else in there and uh, I think we'll be okay. I tried to clean off some of that scorch burn mark as much as I can but the the board is actually a little bit discolored. But that won't hurt anything. So the rest of this board is pretty much done and the only thing left to do now is to repair all the rest of the cracked solder joints on there. Let me shut this fume extractor off for a minute. I think that last recording I did, I didn't have the microphone on, so it's probably going to be quiet. I want to stop here for a minute and show you one of the reasons why the solder joints crack so much on these circuit boards. I took and just removed the solder from this one connection right here, and if you notice, look how large the diameter of that hole is versus the wire that's going through it. And that's one of the problems. When you punch the holes too big for the, for the lead of the component, you're no longer, kind of, you're no longer soldering the, the wire to the pad. You're actually kind of building a solder bridge over top of it, which allows for, for it to flex and crack loose. So that's one of the things that will cause this. If you're designing a circuit board, for instance on KeyCAD or EagleCAD or whatever, make sure that you, you set the hole, di the hole diameter to be close to the lead diameter. You don't want a big huge gap like this or it will make it very difficult. And watch what happens when we solder this. And I'm going to do this without the fume extractor so you can hear me. And you'll see that when you solder it, like this, see what happens? It doesn't like to fill in. And when you do get it to fill in properly, it'll make kind of a dome like that because it's somewhat making a solder bridge across the hole and instead of filling it in. And if you do just fill it in, this is so thin right here that just touching it, you see what happened? It opened right up. And that's the problem. A lot of times when these go through the wave soldering, they don't completely fill in and you don't get a good joint there. And that hole diameter is so big that it'll just, from, flat, from the components flexing and the board flexing, it'll just crack. And that's why all of these are cracking like that. So just something to pay attention to. If you see something from this era that was made like this, you really have to go through and make sure you get get them properly <laughs> reflowed. Now on some of the more modern boards you can get away with that if you have the plated through holes. What's a plated through hole? Well a plated through hole is when they after they drill the hole for the lead in the board they'll put a little they'll insert a little wire ferrule through there. It's like a it's just kind of a little metal sleeve and it'll attach on on this side and go all the way through the board. So when you solder this, not only does it attach to the surface of the trace, but it flows all the way through that plated through hole and fills the entire hole with solder. And that makes a much more positive uh, joint. However, when you don't have that on these, it's really important to have the correct size hole for the lead. You know, people say, Tony, you need a bigger bench. You got too much clutter on there and you can't fit everything on there. Well, I'll be honest, at least for me, I don't know about for other people that do a lot of this sort of bench work. When I'm working on a project like this, I want to have everything right next to me so I can reach it easily. So I tend to put everything right next to where I'm working and it piles up and no matter how big my bench is I would still have that same clutter because I put everything nearby so you know a cluttered bench doesn't necessarily mean you don't have enough room what it means is that you're just putting all your stuff within arm's reach 
so that's why you do that. But I just thought I'd talk a little bit while I'm doing this. I don't know if you want to skip through all of this boring stuff. And again, everybody has their way of soldering these things. The best way would be to remove the old solder from every joint, you know, instead of adding to it. But really, this is flux core solder, and it does a pretty good job of uh, kind of reconstituting <laughs> the old stuff. This is an old enough machine that it's, it has lead-based solder in it, so you're not mixing leaded with lead-free. So really, there's nothing wrong with this. And you kind of don't want to get so much on there that you have a big blob. And that's why you'll see sometimes after I put these on there, I'll reflow them a second time right, at, right at, after the follow-up. And it just kind of makes everything look a little neater. You don't want to do that too much. And when it dries, when it cools, it should be shiny. It shouldn't be dull like, like you see here. See how dull that is? And when we're done, see how shiny it is? That's what it should look like. So I hope you can see what I'm doing. Probably some of you watching this on your mobile device, probably your screen is too small. See what happens there? See how, that, how big that is and oversized for the lead? So what you have to do is fill that in and get it to bridge across there. And that's what causes these problems. So I think you get the point here. Every board in this uh, amplifier is going to need gone over like this. And even with that, I've seen these traces are very, very thin on these boards. And not only are they thin, they're narrow. So again, you, have, you, you still may have problems and you may have to go and find the crack in the trace somewhere down the road. This is what you're getting into if you want to work on or restore one of these amplifiers from this era. And it's not just it's not just these Harman Kardons. I mean, a lot of things at that time were built with this type of board and this type of process. It's just the era that these were built. This is also right around that time that the capacitor blight that people talk about. You can look that up, actually. Uh, I think even Wikipedia has a little article on it. And uh, fortunately, I don't believe these amps suffer from that. They use very good capacitors that don't seem to have that chemical in them that leak, causes them to leak like that. But just be aware things from this era could possibly have those capacitors and it's a good idea because of that to do a complete recap on things from that era. I mean, you remember, I know some of you probably watched my video series on the ADCOM GFA 585 and you saw the damage those capacitors caused. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> that was quite a mess, wasn't it? But, again, that was, uh, there's a lot of computers from that era, too, that had that problem. I can't tell you how many of them we had to, we had, we, some of the ones that we have at work, you know, on some of the x-ray equipment, they use a standard PC motherboard for the controller and they use a basic operating system, you know, like something Microsoft-based or Linux-based. And the software is very specific to that particular motherboard. And it, you can't change the motherboard, so you have to repair it. And I'll tell you what, that's a real pain because the solder is really hard to remove from those multi-layered boards. And every capacitor on the board leaked. <laughs> so the only alternative you have is to repair it and uh, that can be somewhat of a challenge sometimes we usually end up having to go to hot air or something to to get enough heat 
in that area and uh, to get get the leads out but that's kind of what you have to do I guess and uh, I'm looking around the camera here so I'm probably making a mess of some of this but I'll go back off camera and verify all these and make sure they're all good I'll look at them under the microscope possibly I don't know if I feel like setting it up if nothing else I'll use a magnifying glass to make sure seems like no matter how much light you get you still can't see good enough So we're about three quarters of the way through this now. I'm getting a lot closer to finishing it, but you know, every board, like I said, has to be done like this because of the way this was done. And again, I'm not being critical of Harmon Carden because, like I said, this was this was that era. <laughs> Electronics, the way they were being mass produced at the time, a lot of a lot of manufacturers had this problem. And honestly, some people might say this isn't worth it, but if you've ever heard one of these amps, Harman Kardon did a good job on the design of these. The execution wasn't great because of the, you know, this issue, but when you get them up and running, they, they really are an excellent sounding amplifier. For certain tastes, of course, everybody has their preference, what they like and don't like. So let me finish this up. I think I've bent your ear enough. Some of you like that, some of you don't, but uh, we do a little bit of everything and you pick and choose what you want to watch. You don't have to watch it. Okay, I'm all done reflowing all the joints on the board. And you can see it's just a complete mess with flux and so forth. And I do not remove all of the flux. <clears throat> I actually kind of like it on there. This is a non-corrosive flux, so it doesn't hurt the solder joints or the board. And if anything, it kind of protects it a little bit from corrosion. So what I'm going to do is I will take denatured out or denatured or I use anhydrous isopropyl because there's no water residue. And I'll go over and clean all of this, <clears throat> and I'll flood it pretty well with the alcohol while I'm going through here. And it'll just kind of take all that mess off and level it off, and you'll just get a nice sheen on the board. And it won't be sticky or anything like that. It'll just be kind of a waxy feel. But that board will last a long time like that. And then you don't have to worry about trying to mop up all of the excess flux. There's also flux remover spray, and I have that, and I use it sometimes, and it'll remove everything from the board. But uh, I don't like to use it because sometimes it'll soak through the other side of the board, and if there's any screening, screen printing on there, certain types of screen printing it'll remove, and certain components like resistors and things, it'll mess up the, the color bands and things. Not always, but some of them. So I like this method. I'll show you real quick, just in a small area, how I do it. We'll just go right here in the middle, for instance. And you just kind of move it around like that. And see how wet it is. And when, it, when that dries, when, that, when, the, when it, the alcohol evaporates, that'll be just kind of a nice, smooth, shiny finish. And that's all I'm going to do to the whole board. When it's done, it'll look pretty good. And, you know, all this globby looking, like this stuff up here will be gone. I don't know if you can see it or not. But you see all this, kind of this stuff and everything, that'll all be gone. Anyway, that's what we're going to do. I'll clean it up off camera. At this point, I'm going to end this, uh, call it part one. And until next time, I'm going to wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And in part two, We'll get this part put together, and we'll do a quick test and make sure that the amplifier works from the front part, and uh, we'll go from there. 
So until then, stay well, and we'll see you all very soon. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.